let's just figure this out together. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, we're family. Let's just kind of figure it out. So, so the reason why we're here is because in Leviticus 23, we're, we're, we're kind of directed to be here, right? So let's look at that first screen. Um, it says that the Lord is speaking to Moshe about all the feasts, his feasts, the Lord's feasts. He's letting him know, look, you're going to be going to the promised land. These are the things I want you to celebrate. And there's basically seven of them, Shabbat. And then three in the spring, three in the fall, basically three really point to the first coming. The three in the fall really point to the second coming. It's just that simple. So he says, tell the people of Israel, this is his people, his children at this point. You know, it's, it's, it's opened up, obviously, but at this point in time, it's, it's his children. On the 15th day, the seventh month is the Feast of Sukkot for seven days. That's all we know about Sukkot, pretty much. Then he says, on the first day, have a holy convocation, which was last Monday that we did. Don't do any kind of ordinary work. Make it special. Make it special. That doesn't mean don't go in the yard. It doesn't mean don't go for a walk. It doesn't mean, you know, don't wash the car per se. Just don't do what you usually do. Make it special, you know, like a birthday, like an anniversary, like a special day, especially when it comes to the Lord's Feast. Um, and some of the, I don't think anything's going to be hard to swallow today, but you've got to understand, you guys have been marinated in the church. And when you have a golf swing that you're swinging for 50 years, and somebody tries to tweak your grip, it's incredibly uncomfortable. But I'm not trying to tweak your grip. I'm trying to get you to align yourself with the word of God. It does not matter to me whether you embrace these things. Not that I don't care. What I'm saying is it's not going to affect me one bit. We're still going to be doing them. Whether you do it or not is not going to change that. Whether you get closer to God or further away is not going to change my desire to be close to God. You follow? But the litmus, the litmus paper is, is the word, right? You can't deny that, right? I mean, that goes cross-denominational lines. That's all we have. We don't even know how to pray if we don't have the word. And, you know, for those people that say they stand on the Bible, I think you got to maybe get off it and open it up and start to read it. A lot of people say they stand on the Bible. A lot of people say they believe in God. A lot of people say a lot of things. I mean, most people believe in exercise, but who's doing a push-up? Okay, be kind. It's a kind day. It's a kind day, isn't it? It's a, I'm, I'm going to get comfortable because it's a kind day. I, I just want to be kind. Would that be a good idea? Yeah. Um, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then you really ought to show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Good. That put a smile on your face, right? So forget about what I said about standing on the Bible. And let's move on. So it says for seven days you to bring an offering made by fire to the Lord. Um... They always cry when it comes to offerings. It's like a prophetic cry. On the eighth day, see, it's, it's like a separate thing, really. If you, if you talk to any Orthodox Jews, rabbis, it's, a, it's kind of a separate thing. It's kind of attached, but it's weird. It's like, where does this come, what does this have to do with anything? On the eighth day, the eighth day of what? It's not the eighth day of Sukkot. It's after Sukkot, after the seven days, the next day is the eighth day. And on that day... Have a holy convocation. To do what? I don't know. I mean, you could write books on the subject, I'm sure, especially, you know, some folks who get incredible revelation. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's, why do you complicate things so much? Don't you see what I do? I take these esoteric, theological, doctrinal issues and try to make them so that a five-year-old can understand it. Because when they were young, I used to talk to them about the Lord. You can't, you can't use five-syllable words when you're talking to a five-year-old. So why do we have to do it now? It's absolutely superfluous. Just be extemporaneous <laughs> and more spontaneous. On the eighth day, you have the Holy Convocation. That's what we're doing. Bring an offering. That's what we did. It's a public assembly. Here we are. Don't do any kind of ordinary work. Rabbi, you're doing ordinary work. No, this isn't ordinary. It's a feast. So I just think it's really 
it makes all the sense in the spiritual world to kind of go to the end of John chapter 7. Because at the end of John chapter 7, we have Hosanna Rabbah, the seventh day. So maybe, just maybe, if we continue on, we'll see what happened on, on the eighth day. Maybe what, what Yeshua did, it means something. Okay? How's that sound? And sometimes, you know, in the Bible, between chapters, there's six months' time. Like chapter 7, there was six months, because chapter 6 ends with Passover. Chapter 7 starts with Sukkot. That's six months later. I know a lot of people think, well, the chapter, that means five minutes later. No, you've got to put it on a timeline. This might be all new. Like, wow, what are you telling me to do? Study and think and actually read the scripture and try to understand it? No, I'm telling you to memorize a few verses and make your kids memorize verses so they'll have no idea who God is. I have nothing else to take off. I, I got to. <laughs> okay, so here we go. This is the end, this is the end of chapter 7 right here, this verse. Then they all left because what do you do after a feast? You leave. It's done. It's over. They're, they're all in Jerusalem. They've come from very far. Some have come from Rome. They're far. They've got to get home. You know? I mean, they've got to catch a plane. No, there's no plane. See? So it's going to be a long journey, very long journey. And they've been there for seven days, and it's time to get home. It's going to take a long time to get home. They've got to get back to work. They've got to get back to providing for their families. You know, the feast is over. So they all go to their own homes who live locally. And, but Yeshua, but Yeshua. So we're going to learn something. It's going to be really cool. This is like my favorite thing to talk about. But Yeshua went to the Mount of Olives. That was his, that was his hang. Everybody has their place, right? You might have a room in your house. Uh, for me, it was I used to take a bike on this bike ride uh, every day and spend, you know, an hour with the Lord when I lived in Florida. Um, everybody has their place, usually, their little prayer closet or a special place that means something to them, right? His was the Mount of Olives. And um, at daybreak, so now what are we talking? What day is this? Okay, this isn't rocket science. See, it, 7.53 was the seventh day. So at daybreak, what day would that be? It's not a trick question. It's the next day. It's daybreak, see? The feast is over, and it's daybreak. And so, it, where the, so here we are at the eighth day. I don't know if he's going to do anything, but it says in Leviticus 23 that you should celebrate the eighth day. So let's see what he does. At daybreak, he appeared again in the temple court where all the people gathered around him. So he's at the Mount of Olives. He probably caught some Z's, spent time with his father, prayed up, got some direction, because that's what he did. He didn't get to his father just to hang out. He got to his father to say, okay, pops, what do I do now? See, he was totally obedient. Totally obedient. Just like really Moses was a special cat because Moses used to go into the tabernacle and go, okay, what do I tell them? He didn't have an agenda. His agenda was God's agenda. Special guy. Special guy. Do I have a couple of minutes? Are you guys in a rush? I just want to show you. I, I, I wasn't going to do this, uh, but th th this is something. This is something else. I just want to read you a few verses from John 7 towards the end, and I want to show you how foolhardy some people are. So Yeshua just finishes talking about the living water on Hoshana Rabbah. You know, I am the living waters. Come on to me and all that. And then it says in verse 4, I'm just going to read a little bit. On hearing his words, Yeshua's words, some people in the crowd said, surely this man is the prophet. Not a prophet. You understand? Now, most people would read that and go, what's the difference? Oh, it's all the difference in the world. He's speaking only to Jews. The Jews were waiting for the prophet, not a prophet. They weren't waiting for another Isaiah or another Jeremiah or another Ezekiel. Why do we know that? Because it says so in Deuteronomy 18.15 and 18.18. 18, Moses says there's a prophet coming like me, but listen to everything he says. That's the prophet. You follow? What, what do they know? There's no New Testament, sweet pea. All they have is the Old Testament. That's all you need to see the Messiah. So they know. They're waiting for the prophet. So some of the people heard him speak, and they're like, uh-uh, this guy's not just an Isaiah. He's not speaking for God. He's like speaking as God. It's like it's God speaking to us. You follow? Some of the people. So they're going, could this be the prophet? And then others said, hey, 
maybe this is the Messiah. When, when Yeshua comes in the room, there's all, there's all, you know, everybody gets crazy. But others said, how can the Messiah come from the Galil, from the Galilee? Listen to how ignorant. Doesn't the Tanakh, that's the Old Testament, that's the Torah, the Ketuvim, and the Nevim, that's the first five books, the prophets, and the writings, the whole Old Testament. Doesn't the Old Testament say that the Messiah is the seed of David and comes from Bethlehem? Yes, 2 Samuel says he'd be from the seed of David, and Micah says that he'd be born in Bethlehem. So they're saying, how could... Knucklehead, he was born in Bethlehem. You see, when you read the Bible, when you read the Bible, like when you read about Lot and the two daughters sleeping with him, my friend in India just got pulled into a temple, and they made him read that. Yes, you have it made in America, hon. Yes. They made him read that, and he wasn't strong enough to understand. There are many things written in the Bible that happen, but they're not of God. Do you follow? When, when read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's full of a jaded man who the Spirit of God is not on. So you have to know what's of God and what's not of God. Why does he put those in there? Because in life we make decisions and sometimes we make bad ones. He's trying to show you bad ones too. He's trying to show you the ramification of that. Who were the sons of Lot's daughters when they slept with their father? Ammon and Edom. And who were the Edomites and the Ammonites? Arch, enery, arch enemies of Israel. So they're saying, it's, it's amazing, they're saying, he's from the Galilee. Don't he, doesn't he have to be born in Bethlehem? He was. So the people were divided because of him. The people are always going to be divided because of him. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword, mother against daughter. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's rough picking the Lord over your own family. But... But I just got a call from our leaders in Australia. They're dealing with something about that. It's sad. You know, a lot of times when people, I never ask for membership because it's, to me it's not even biblical. I've never asked you to join anything. I've never took attendance. I never said, how come you haven't been here? You're big boys and big girls. I'm not going to keep tabs on you. It's not my job. My job is to do what God wants me to do, and who's ever here is here. But this is what always gets me. If you go to a church on Sunday, every Sunday, do I ever tell you to leave that church? Then why does the church tell you not to come here? Almost always. Because God forbid, you know, you might see something and then you might share it with somebody and this is not the way we do it. We've been doing it this way since 1762. Yeah, you need to go back to 62. Anyway, just a sup. I'll take a sip of water. You know, you can't read the Word of God, though, no matter how nice you want to be, and not have some conviction. The Word of God is sharper than any double edged sword. And when you feel a little sword in your heart, that is not Greg Hirschberg, that is Father God. And you can get mad at me all you want. Listen, when Yeshua was speaking, they got mad at him, they wanted to kill him. But they were just mad because they were convicted and they didn't want to feel bad. Instead of them crying out for mercy, they figured, let me shut them down. The word of God's going to change you. If you don't want it to change you, then you've arrived. You're perfect. You're perfect, buddy, right? God help you if you think you've arrived. So... The gods come back to the head Kohanim and the Pharisees and the priests, and they asked them, why didn't you bring him in? They sent the gods to get him. And the gods said, no one ever spoke the way this guy speaks. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? I mean, these are hired hands, man. These are assassins. And they say, you mean you've been taken in as well? They, they're freaking out. They're starting to lose it, man. Their little club is going down, you know? Their little culture club. That's the way it is in the religious community a lot of times. They have a club. They have a way of doing things. You know, religion, man's plans. Has any of the authorities trusted him? Now they're asking, did, did any of the big dogs trust him? They're freaking out. They're panic stricken. you got to read this. you got to put yourself there. Scripture is not sterile. 
It's not doctrine. It's life. It breeds life. Don't you see yourself? Don't you see what's happening? It's not just a couple of take two verses and call me in the morning. This is life. It will change you if you'll let it. If you'll let it. If you'll let it. God cannot force you to change. Has any of the authorities trusted him or any of the Pharisees? They said no. They're like, oh, good. We still got our boys. But he says, these Amharets, you know what the Amharets are? The commoners, like you and me. The ones who didn't go to the fancy schools. But he goes, they do. Some of the common people do, and you know what they say? Ah, it's okay. They don't know nothing about Torah. They're under a curse. Just dismiss it. They're just commoners. What do they know? And then Nachthimon, you know Nachthimon, a.k.a. what's his name in, in your Bible? Nicodemus. Do you know any Jew from Israel that would be named Nicodemus? But this is all we know, right? The last shepherd shows, shows Yeshua with long hair. Do you think Yeshua had long hair? How could he have long hair when it says in Corinthians that a man shouldn't have hair like a woman? But we've seen him that way our whole life, so it has to be. Right? The Last Supper. He's got a loaf of bread at the Passover. If he bit that bread, we're done. Why would you have the gospel according to Leonardo da Vinci? Nachtimon, Nachtimon, just as a side note, means innocent blood. Joseph of Arimathea climbed up that ladder and took Yeshua off the cross and handed him to who? Nachtimon. And Yeshua would have still been bleeding. So the man called innocent blood would have had on his forearms the most innocent blood there ever was. Look how much we miss. Because we trusted man. But they said, Nachthimon, the man who had gone to Yeshua before and was one of them, said to them, our Torah doesn't condemn a man, does not See, they're, they're playing by their own rules. They're not, they say they're Torah observant, but they're not. Until after hearing him and finding out what he's doing, there's no witnesses. It's a kangaroo court. And then listen to what they reply to Nicodemus. You aren't from the Galil too, like you're with them? Look at these guys, they're such... They said, study the Tanakh and see for yourself. Listen to how ignorant they are. They're the leaders. Study the Tanakh and see for yourself, last verse, guys, that no prophet comes from the Galil, from the Galilee. Is that true? See, you, you gloss over that, but I'm telling you, you shouldn't gloss over anything that God says because it says in 2 Kings 14, 25, that Jonah was from Gath Hefer, which is the border of Zebulun, which is the Galil. Now, is Jonah a prophet? So they don't know what they're talking about. But they're the leaders. And what do people do with their leaders? Sit in church for 20 years and just listen. Study to show yourself approved. Because if you're unapproved and you go before God, and you go, well, I'm sorry, Rabbi Greg told me. You know what he's going to say? Who's Rabbi Greg? Remember, I've always told you from the day I got here, study, line it up, check with the Word of God, make sure it's energized by the Holy Spirit, make sure it lines up. Okay, let's get back to our story. I just want to show you how off they were. Okay, so it's the eighth day, and what does he do? He teaches, because that's who he is, a teacher. He's teaching. He didn't do a lot of preaching. He did some preaching, but he was a teacher. He was a teacher, no question about it. So the next day, the eighth day, Yeshua comes off the Mount of Olives, heads west over the Kidron Valley, and comes into the temple because there's still a lot of people there. And that's the, you got to understand the temple was, this, was where God was in Jerusalem. That's where everybody meant to discuss anything, discuss things about God, discuss about the school system, discuss anything. It was at the temple in the outer courtyard. Now look at this. Look at the next three verses, John 8, 3 through 5. This is... This is so good that I, I'm, I don't know what to do with myself. Not the scriptures are so good. The Torah teaches, 
and the perishing. The Pharisees were the leaders. The Torah teachers were those who taught the word of God and interpreted it. They brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery. Isn't this interesting that this is going on right on the eighth day? Eight meaning new beginnings. We don't know what it's all about, but this scenario is going to tell us exactly what it's all about. She had been caught committing adultery, so obviously she was caught in the act, and made her stand in the center of the group. Now, that's pretty disgusting. I mean, they could have put her off to the side, right, and talked to them. Why, why throw her in the center? And do you think they really gave her a chance to, like, get dressed? You know what, sweetheart, just get dressed. They're so, they so just want to trap him that they're using her, and so they're not thinking about her. So do you think they said, clean yourself up a bit? I mean, who knows what she was wearing? She might have been wearing scanty. She might have been naked. They probably put her in a gunny sack and threw her in the middle of the temple courtyard. Not the temple, but the courtyard. And, and his heart's breaking because he's like, really? Really? I, you see what I want you to do? I don't want you to read the scripture. I want you to feel the scripture. I want you to feel the scripture because when you feel God, it's a game changer. Then they said to him, Rabbi, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in our Torah, our Torah, because he's a Jew, he's a rabbi. In our Torah, Moses commanded that such a woman be stoned to death. What do you say about it? They're trapping him. If he says stone to the death, because, you know, to be honest with you, there weren't too many people stoned. To be honest with you, you know how the Bible says, you know, an unruly son who does not want to repent should be stoned. In the history of Israel, there wasn't one son who was stoned. Because they have too much of a heart. You know, nobody wants to stone their kids, so they always find a loophole. But now they're ready to stone this girl. Why? They could care less about her. If he stones her, what are they going to say about him? It's cruel. It's heartless. Right? If, if, plus, he's going to get in trouble with Rome because he has no right to do that. Only Rome could give the approval because they were the governing authority. If he says, don't stone her, then the religious order is going to be like, oh, you don't obey the Torah? He can't win, can he? Or can't he? Let me just show you how off they were and how they were twisting the law, okay? Deuteronomy 22. Rabbi, why do you have to show this? Because you didn't know to go to Deuteronomy 22, did you? Right, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help you so you know, and then you could tell somebody. It says, if a man is found sleeping with a woman who has a husband, both of them must die. Where's the guy? They just twisted the law. So they're using the law, but inappropriate. They're twisting the law. Who twists things? Did God really say? Don't twist things. Don't be twisted. A twisted person is spiritually perverted. Don't be twisted. In this way, you will expel such wickedness from Israel. Yes, it was wicked. If a girl who is a virgin is engaged to a man, so let's say she wasn't married. I'll give you that. Let's say she, we don't know, right? If she was, then the guy should have been there. Let's say she wasn't married. If a girl is engaged, that means betrothed. She's not, the marriage hasn't been consummated. She has not slept with the guy yet. She's a betrothed virgin. And another man comes upon her in the town and has sexual relations with her. You were to bring them both out to the city gate and stone them to death. So if she wasn't a betrothed virgin, then she shouldn't be stoned. Unless she was married and the guy should have been there. If she wasn't married and not a betrothed virgin, then she shouldn't be stoned. They're totally twisted. You follow? Totally twisted. By the way, look. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in up to 1965 in the great state of Texas, if you found your wife or your husband with somebody, you could shoot them. And on the books, it was considered justifiable homicide. Now, all I'm saying is that would probably stop a lot of adultery. At least the person who was shot would stop. I'm just saying we got a weak society. You can get a divorce today over any... I just don't want to be married. What? Show me something. What do you mean you don't want to be married? Well, I'm just not happy. There's as much divorce in the church as there is outside the church. I know some of you have been. 
It's water under the bridge. It's done. Don't call me and say, you made me feel bad. It's over, okay? If you haven't been forgiven, we could talk about that. It's done. I'm not concerned so much about your sensitivity. I'm concerned about my young people making mistakes going forward. I can't stop what happened, but I can be preventative. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> now we'll go to John 8, 6, the very next verse. They said this to trap him. This is deplorable. This is disgusting. This is a Jezebel spirit. There's nothing of God here. So that they might have ground for bringing charge. They just want to nail him. doesn't matter who they... I meet people like this in the church. They don't care. They want their way and they don't care how many people they step on to get it. If that is you, please remove yourself from the premises. But Yeshua bent down and began writing in the dust with his finger. Now, does anybody know what he wrote? Any ideas? What do you think? Just raise a hand. What do you think he wrote? Their sins. Okay, if they, he wrote their sins, he'd still be writing. <laughs> Just saying. It's a, it's, a, it's a very viable answer. I'm not making fun. It is. That's a beautiful thing. But legitimately, those Pharisees, he'd still be writing today. Anybody else? Yes, sir. The correct law. Maybe. Possibly. Their names? Possibly. Ten words, maybe? These are all good answers. We don't know, but yours truly only knows to use the Bible. I, I only know. So let me show you a scripture and see if it makes any sense. Okay? Look at what Jeremiah wrote. Hope of Israel, Adonai. All who abandon you will be ashamed. Those who leave you will be inscribed in the dust. See, go back to 8.6 for a second. They had no legitimate charge against him, so they're manufacturing one. In Judaism, when you inscribe somebody's name in the dust, it's the opposite, the antithesis of being inscribed in the book of life. And he was letting them know something. That's my take. I can't, I can't assume things. Because when you assume, <laughs> but I think they knew. They knew Jeremiah all too well. All too well. And he was saying, dust in the wind. All they are is dust in the wind. You follow? He was saying, get right. Even he was being merciful towards them. Moving on to 8-7. This is how you got to read scripture, guys. You can't just grab a verse in the morning like a fortune cookie and then run off to work. I want, I want to ask you to do something before we leave today. 8-7, um, it says, when they kept questioning him, because now, now they're like he's got them. <laughs> he's kind of got them, and they're like, what do we do now? He straightened up. And he said to them, the one of you who is without sin, man, don't throw stones if you live in a glass house. You're going to break a lot of windows. Man, this is, this is unbelievable. Now, he's not excusing sin. Guys, he's not saying that adultery, lying, stealing, not taking the poor, the widow, and the orphan. He's not saying that that's good. Don't think that. That's called grace abuse. That's what the American church is teaching. He's not excusing the sin at all. This does not, this does not excuse it. It's, and Yeshua is not excusing it. In actuality, he's condemning those who are guilty but have not been caught. How many of us point the fingers at the person who's guilty? Oh, he got a speeding ticket? How often do you speed? You just didn't get caught. Who are you kidding? You're not kidding me. 
And I'm a knucklehead, so if you're not kidding me, you're definitely not kidding God. Okay, 8, 8, 8, 9. Then he bends down again. Uh Uh-oh. Double portion. See, they didn't leave when he said, okay, go ahead, stoner, because you have every right to. You're so good. You're so perfect. And they still didn't get the memo. So then he writes down again, and now they're shaken. Now they're visibly shaken. On hearing this, they began to leave one by one, the older ones first. You know why the older ones leave first? You know how the young guys are, all full of that testosterone and stuff. Yeah, we, we, we really, we got this. We're the young Pharisees. There's a new sheriff in town. But they left too. And now what you're going to see is the quintessential picture of what Beth Yeshua and what we've been doing for the last 25 years is all about. This next verse. Look at 10 through 11. Standing up. Now he's finished with them. Now he's going to deal with her. He says, where are they? Now, you've got to imagine, I just, I mean, this is, I don't know, this is how my mind works. It's very pictorial. It's very visual. Um, I have a vivid imagination. I never played any video games. So I, it's all like, when I read the scripts, it's like a movie. Yeah. Yeah. And I picture the girl as half naked. If she has any clothes on, she's probably been crying. She's very mucousy. She can't see that well. And she's thinking it's over. Plus, she's thinking maybe... Is this the way my husband's going to remember me? Is this the way my kids are going to remember me? My mother was the adulteress who got stoned to death in the temple. Imagine what's going through her head. Maybe she's done this a hundred times. Maybe it was just one time where she messed up. I don't know. But I do know she's hurting big time. And she wishes she was dead. Or she wishes she never did it. And here's Yeshua, man. Where are they? And she's looking through her tears and has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Yeshua says, then neither do I. Is that not the grace of God? And for you who have never committed adultery, do you know how much spiritual adultery we've committed? Loving other things, putting other things first? caring about ourselves, talking about ourselves, constantly caught up with ourselves, that's spiritual adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Now, most people in the religious world, that's where they stop. That's where they stop. Hey, this is great. And who knows? I could see her going, this is great. Now, is her husband going to find out? Probably. Probably. Why? You know, famous last words. Rabbi, I won't tell anybody. (laughs) No, you won't tell anybody. You'll tell everybody. That was accurate. So probably going to find it. But she's, this is, she's clicking her heels. She's got a new lease on life. And she's, she's out of there. But he goes, sweetheart, hold on. Let's not forget the last part. See, the grace is great, but without the truth, it's nothing. The truth is great, but without the grace, if you live in just this truth, when you need grace, you're not going to get it. God says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That means cursed are the unmerciful, for they shall not. He says, now go, just don't do it no more. That's the whole idea of what's going on with Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot. It's not about, okay, I'll just keep doing and then I'll just keep going back to the well. And It's like just let's try to stop some stuff. At least give it a good effort. Now, there's no question in my mind, guys, that she is not going to be able to do this without the Spirit of God. She's going to need there's a human side and a divine side. You're going to need to want it because, come on, talk to me. The things you want, you don't get? When you want some, it could be anything. It could be a tool. It could be anything. When you want it, you will save. You will do whatever you have to do to get it. So don't, don't give me this, oh, it's all up to God. No, it's up to you too. It's up to your will. You have a will. You have a decision maker. 
It's not by chance, it's by choice. You decide, and then you humble yourself and say, God, I need your help. I can't do this without you. And when you put those two together, it's like a combustion. It's like an explosion, you know? It's quite, 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 quite beautiful. Now, getting on to what this day is all about. Is it about new beginnings, the eighth day? Yeah, I think it is. I think these people, the Israelites, have experienced Yom Teruah. They heard the shofar. They've come before God on atonement. They asked for forgiveness. They've been forgiving, and now they're filled with his spirit. They're filled with his presence on Sukkot. And God's trying to say, don't stop. Like, don't, don't let the feast stop. Keep, keep it going. You know what I mean? Let me show you what I mean. You familiar with the Talmud? 63 tractates. I love when people say, well, I read the Talmud. Really? You've read all 6,200 6, pages? And of those 6,200 pages, how much have you retained? There's 6,200 pages. It's two components. You've got the Mishnah and the Gomorrah. The Mishnah is the oral law. The Gomorrah is the rabbinical analysis. And it's commentary. Let me just show you one section of the Mishnah. Just three sentences. Mishnah on Sukkot, fifth chapter, second to fifth verse. There were four golden menorahs with four golden bowls at the top of each and four ladders leading to each bowl. Four strong young priests, because it was, they were really high up, would climb up with pitches, each holding nine liters of oil, which they would pour into the bowls. There was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not lit up by the light. So they did this as part of Sukkot going into the eighth day. They lit up these menorahs and all of Jerusalem was lit up at night. And what were they praying for? Of course, they were praying for winter rains and sunlight because without sunlight, they're not going to have any crops in the spring. But more importantly, they were praying for the light of Messiah to come. And in the midst of all this light, Yeshua in the the 12th verse of the 8th chapter of John says this. He speaks up loud. I am the light of the world. You see when you put it in context how rich it is and when you try to read this theologically and you tell the the people in the world about theology and they're like, I don't get it. Make it a movie. Connect the dots. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light which gives life. He's saying you don't have to keep stumbling through life, guys. Kids, you don't have to keep stuck. Rabbi, I don't know what to do. He does. But are you willing to, to, to have his will for your life? Are you willing to do what he wants you to do? Because it's different for everybody. You don't have to stumble. He's saying, I'll show you the way. In fact, I am the way. And following me, you'll have protection and prosperity, most of all peace. Here's the $64,000 question. We're at the end of the full feast. So what are we going to do now? Wait for, wait for the spring feast? How about a conference? Good old woman's conference. That's what we need. You know, where women could just eat cookies and take off their shoes. Yoga pants. What are we going to do after the worship service? You're going to, I'm not going to be here next week. You can have a worship service, and then you'll be all, all, and then what? We celebrate Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot constantly. When we're off and we hear the shofar, come back. Atone, be filled with his presence. Hear the shofar, come back. Atone, be filled with his presence. You follow? Listen to what rabbinic literature says. This is absolutely gorgeous. Our creator is like a host who invites us as visitors for a limited time. This is talking about the eighth day. But when the time comes for us to leave, he has enjoyed himself so much. We're so busy. Running and gunning. Broken cisterns. Even us in ministry, some I see my friends in ministry, their ministry is their God. Oh, we ministered to this one and ministered to that one. Listen to you. It's your God. 
It's the way you're fulfilling your insecurity. And you're driving yourself crazy and your kids are suffering because of it. And they won't tell you they're suffering because they love you so much, they don't want to embarrass you. God's just saying, stay just a little bit longer. Please, please, please say that you will, say you will. I'm going to end with a children's book. This is a book that I read to all my kids. It's, I, don't, I would have to say it's my favorite. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. I'm going to sit because I never stood when I read the books to my kids. All right. It's called Just the Way You Are. I decided I wasn't going to put up any illustrations because I wanted you to try to illustrate it in your head. That's what you have to start to do with the scriptures. We have taught this way now here for almost, four, it's 14 years. 14 years we've been here. You have to start to see the pictures. A long time ago, in a land much like your own, there was a village. And in the village lived five orphans. A lonely family of fatherless children they had banded together against the cold. One day the king learned of their misfortune and decided to adopt them. He announced that he would be their father and would come for them soon. When the children learned that they had a new father and their father was the king and that the king was coming to visit, they went wild with excitement. When the people of the village learned that the children had a father and their father was the king and that the king was coming to the village, they were excited as well. They went to see the children and told them what to do. You need to impress the king, they said. Only those with great gifts to give will be allowed to live in the castle. The people didn't know the king. They just thought that all kings want to be impressed. So the children began preparing gifts to offer the king. They worked long and hard to be sure the king would approve. One of the children, man, this is so me. (laughs) One of the children who knew how to carve decided to give the king a wonderful work of wooden art. He set his knife against the soft bark of the elm and whittled. The small blocks of wood came alive with the eyes of a sparrow or the nose of a horse. His sister decided to present the king with a painting that captured the beauty of the heavens, a painting worthy to hang in his castle. Another sister chose music as her way to impress the king. For long hours, she practiced with her voice and mandolin. The people would stop at her window and listen to her music as it took wings and soared. Yet another child, set out to turn the king's head with his wisdom, would find themselves in late hours with books open, geography, math, chemistry, The breadth of his study was matched only by the depth of his desire. Surely a king would appreciate all his knowledge. But there was one sister who had nothing to offer. Her hand was clumsy with the knife. Her fingers stiff with the brush. When the little girl opened her mouth to sing, the sound was hoarse. She wasn't much of a reader. She believed she had no talent. And so she believed she had no gift. All she had to offer was her heart for her heart was good. She spent her time at the city gates watching the people come and go. She would earn pennies to buy food for her brothers and sisters by grooming people's horses or feeding their animals. She was a simple, stable girl, but she had a good heart. She knew the beggars by name. She took time to pet each dog. She welcomed home the travelers and greeted the strangers. How was your journey, she would ask. Tell me what you learned on your visit. How was your husband? Do you enjoy your new work? She was full of questions for people because her heart was big and she cared about people. They were all the same to her, the beggars and the rich. She cared for all of them just the way they were. But since the little girl thought she had no talent and no gift, she was afraid that the king would be disappointed. She remembered the village's advice and set her mind about the task of making a gift for the king. She took a small knife and went to her brother, the carver. Could you teach me to carve, she asked. Sorry, the young craftsman responded without looking up. 
I have much work to do. I, I haven't time for you. The king is coming, you know. The girl put away her knife and picked up a brush. She went to her sister, the artist. She found her on a hill painting a sunset on a canvas. You paint so beautifully, said the girl, who had no gift but a big heart. I know, the painter answered. Could you share your gift with me? Not now, the sister responded with her eyes on her palette. The king is coming, you know. The girl with no gift then remembered her other sister, the one with the song. She'll help me, she said. When she arrived at her sister's house, she found a crowd of people waiting to listen to her sister sing. Sister, she called. Sister, I've come to listen and learn. But her sister couldn't hear. The noise of the applause was too loud. With a heavy heart, the girl turned and walked away. Then she remembered her other brother. She took a book with small words and big letters and went to see him. I have nothing to offer the king, she said. Can you teach me to read so I might show him my wisdom? The young sage-to-be didn't speak. He was lost in thought. The child with no gift spoke again. Could you help me? I have no talent. Go away, said the scholar, scarcely moving his eyes from the text. Can't you see I'm preparing myself for the coming of the king? And so the girl went away sadly. She had nothing to give. She returned to her place at the city gates and took up her task of caring for people's animals. After some days, a man in merchant's clothes came to the small town. Can you feed my donkey, he asked the girl. The orphan jumped to her feet and looked into the brown face of the one who had traveled far. His skin was leathery from the sun and his eyes were deep. His kind smile warmed the girl's heart. That I can, she answered eagerly, leading the animal to the trough. Trust him to me. When you return, he'll be groomed and fed. Tell me, she asked, as the donkey drank, have you come to stay for only a while? I'm looking for someone. Are you weary from your journey? That I am. Would you like to sit and rest? The girl motioned to a bench near the wall. The tall man sat on the bench, leaned against the wall, closed his eyes, and slept. After a few minutes, he woke and found the girl sitting at his feet, watching his face. She was embarrassed that he had caught her staring. She turned away. Have you been sitting there long? Yes. What do you seek? Nothing. You seem to be a kind man with a peaceful heart. It's good to be near you. The man smiled and stroked his beard. You are a wise girl, he said. When I return, we'll visit more. The man did return quite soon. Did you find the ones you were seeking, the girl asked? I found them, but they were too busy for me. What do you mean? Well, the first one I came to see was a woodsmith rushing to complete a project. He told me to return tomorrow. Another was an artist. I saw her sitting on a hillside, but the people below said she didn't want to be disturbed. The other was a musician. I sat with the others and listened to her music. When I asked to talk with her, she said she had no time. The other I saw it had left. He had moved to the city to go to a school. The girl's eyes widened. as she realized who the man was. But you don't look like a king, she gasped. I try not to, he explained. Being a king can be lonely. People act strangely around me. They always ask for favors. They try to impress me, and they bring me all their complaints. But isn't that what a king is for, asked the girl. Certainly, responded the king, but there are times when I just want to be with my people. There are times when I want to talk to my people, to hear about their day, to laugh and cry. There are times when I just want to be their father. Is that why you adopted the children? That's why. Adults think they have to impress me. Children don't. They just want to talk to me. They know that I love them just the way they are. But my brothers and sisters were too busy? They were. But I'll come back. Maybe they'll have more time another day. 
The girl hesitated. Sir, what about me? I have no gift, but I would like to be a child. The king smiled. My dear, you gave me the best gift of all. You gave me your heart. Your kindness, your time, your love. Of course you'll be my child. I love you just the way you are. And so it happened that the children with many talents but no time missed the visit of the king, while the girl, whose only gift was the gift of a heart, became the child of the king. That's the eighth day. And you're talking to a a recovering, I mean, if you only knew, there's no way I can explain it to you, and there's no way I probably need to. But I meet so many people, especially here, with so much talent. I mean, I, I, I really tried to be talented in so many ways. I killed myself being an athlete, but I just didn't have the size. I just got killed playing football. Injury after injury after injury, but I, I wanted to so bad. I had, I had the zeal, but didn't have the skill set. And then I tried to be artistic, but I, I have no artistic ability whatsoever. And then I thought, I oh, mean, I'd love to, I, I so envy musicians, I would just love to play, and I, I hired somebody. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, I hired this guy after about six weeks. I thought he was going to commit suicide. <laughs> so I just paid him a lot of money and quit. I just said, this is going to really destroy your life if you continue to try to teach me. And then I can't fix anything. If there's, the, there's still a handle loose in my sink, I've tried to fix it and fix it and fix it. I don't even know where the screw is. I don't... It, <laughs> I just keep doing things. I get a couple of tools, like a Swiss Army knife and a and Bernadette's little pink screwdriver set. <laughs> but the truth is, I have I have no talent. I'm not saying this to be humble. I'm just trying to make a point. I have no talent whatsoever. I have no skill set. And I thought when I met the Lord, I'd have to. I'd have to bring him something. You know, he's not just going to accept me the way I am, especially with some of the things I've done. That performance will kill you. I'm so tired of it. And, you know, I got together with the kids about, uh, they're not kids, but to me, they're kids, some 58, they're probably in their 20s. And when I got together with them, it's such a pleasure. You know why? because they didn't ask me a thousand questions in the book of Revelation. See, you adults, you don't want to hang out with me. You just want to ask me questions. You don't want me. See, that's where the girl wanted the king. She didn't care what he had to offer. She seemed just happy to be with him. When I go hang out with them, they just, they let me just laugh and be normal. But the reason why I don't hang out with too many adults is they don't, won't let me be normal. They think I'm some sage or something. I keep telling you I'm not. The only thing I got going for me is I I love to just spend time in God's presence and just maybe just feel his heartbeat, just hang out with him. I can do that anywhere. So let this be a new beginning for all of us. And, And let us go forward and really, really, really love each other and care about each other. We all have addictions. We all have quirks. All of you. You know yourself. You know you're quirky. You know there's things about you you wish you could change. You know there's things you've tried to change for 30, 40, 50 years, and still you just can't seem to, right? We all have something. But if we can not focus on some of those things and overlook some of those things and really bring out the great part about us is that we really do love the Lord, and he has given us a new heart, and we're not who we used to be, I think we'll get along just fine. Let's stand together. I'm off to East Tennessee next week. 
It's going to be fun. They got a fantastic church. It's really wild. I mean, here's this guy teaching on the feast, and I'm going to teach the cross. Isn't that interesting? So you'll be in good hands. You'll have a beautiful time of praise and worship and prayer. And I think that's just what the doctor ordered, the great physician, for, for this time, finishing things up. And then we'll get back first week in November, and we'll have a great Torah Pasha because we're back to Genesis. Talk about Noah and, uh, and what went on there with the ark. So we'll have a great time. I love you very much. Hope you enjoy your day today. And um, just, just shine your light. You got a lot of it. Just shine it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Viasem lecha shalom. Chag Sameach, guys.